Good morning, and welcome to La Jolla Presbyterian Church Podcast. Today we're joined by our Director of Women's Ministries, Cynthia Blaze. Cynthia is leading a women's Bible study on Wednesday mornings in conjunction with our 31-week series, The Story, and we want to share it with you. Cynthia, would you tell us a little bit more about this class? Thank you, Jim. I'm really excited to be going through the whole Bible with a wonderful group of ladies in this class. We have a great community and encourage you to join us. We also understand that not everybody can make it every week or may not be in the area. That's why we're recording and sharing this content. We're following a book called The Story. It's a chronological journey through the Bible and we'll tackle one chapter per week. If you're in La Jolla on Wednesday mornings, we'd love to have you join us. Thank you, Cynthia, for sharing your gifts with this larger audience. And thank you for listening. We hope this study is a blessing to you. Feel free to share it with a friend. And if you have any questions about the church, or if there's any way we can pray for you, you can find our website at ljpress.org. Without further ado, here's this week's discussion. Well, thank you all for being here. I'd like to open us in a quick prayer, and then we'll get to we'll dive in. Uh, Father, thank you for this moment, and thank you for this morning. Thank you for these ladies that have gathered here. I pray that as we study your word, that you open all of our hearts and minds to understand you. And I pray that you will give me the words to be able to teach your, teach your word, that it may become clear, and that we can grow closer to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Um, so I wanted to start this morning with like a great funny story, something my kids did to make us all laugh, but... I was sitting in a um, staff meeting yesterday at church, and they started talking about Las Vegas. And I just felt like with the impact of that, I really couldn't start this sort of funny this week. I felt very, like, touched with that. And I think that, you know, we struggle when we have great tragedy in our nation. And I think um, what we see, obviously, is that we live in a world where sin is very present and that there is great evil That happens, and even when we talked in our first week in Genesis with um, Adam and Eve and the Garden of Evil, Garden of Eden, we saw that from the beginning that the serpent was there and he was bringing sin, that he was bringing pain. And I think in some ways we realize that there's kind of this cosmic battle that goes on. That of and then as I was thinking about Sunday, I sort of was like my first thought was that was kind of a win for the dark side, you know. Like, and we know that that's not the ultimate win. We know, because we have been reading scripture, that it talks about in Genesis that um, the, the serpent will strike the keel of the offspring of Eve, right? We've read that. But that he will ultimately, the offspring of Eve will ultimately crush the head of Satan. And so we have this time where we live now in this present where we still live before that ultimate crushing, Right? So we still live in this period where there is great, there's great, there's great sadness and great evil that happens. And I was reminded of, um, there's a passage in John 10, 10, where in speaking about Satan, Jesus calls him the thief, the great thief. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And I think we see, you know, on Sunday, that was a moment of the thief came and there was, he stole, he killed, he destroyed. But we have the promise of great abundant life, abundant life here on earth. By walking in his, by walking with Jesus, we have great life, great abundant here, life here. And we also have this promise of a future, perfect abundance, where it says in Revelations, it says in speaking about heaven, that God will wipe every tear from our eyes. And that that's the hope we look forward to. And there is this moment where all of our tears are wiped away. Um, and also we know that somehow through tragedies, that God can also work great goodness. And uh, in Romans 8, 28, it says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So we also have this promise that even in sadness, even in tragedies, the great goodness can come out of it. And what's interesting is that actually really brings us entirely to our story of Joseph as I was thinking through all of this, because Joseph is a story of great tragedies and problems happening to him, and yet, ultimately, there is goodness, and there is a plan that comes out of it. 
So um, I thought for a moment of review, I kind of wanted to just talk to you guys a little bit about, so what's the, what is the big idea of what we're doing here in this Bible study? I know we've, this is our third time. Thank you all for coming again. I appreciate you all showing up. Um, so what's the big idea? The big idea is that we are talking about the continuous story of Scripture. What is the continuous story of Scripture? And those of you who have your book, The Story, that's awesome. Our church as a whole is reading through that. What I am doing is I'm not actually going to be reading from the story when I teach, but I'm going to be covering the same passages, the same part that Paul is covering every single week. Um, and I might bring out a little bit more of the story because he, he gets 20 minutes and I get you for an hour. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think it's to emphasize God's relationship. Absolutely. Absolutely. We continue. Exactly. And that's exactly what we were getting at. She said to emphasize God's relationship with us. And that is, that is the story of scripture is God reaching out and having a relationship with us. Um, and then when we look at the Old Testament, which is what we're starting with, we are looking for, um, and the Old Testament is all the books written before Jesus came, we are looking for the expectation for Christ in those books. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking at the continuous story of Scripture, and we're looking at do we see an expectation for Jesus in the Old Testament, in these older books, so that when he arrives on the scene, do we get it? So that's kind of our, our big picture. Um, our first week, we talked about creation. We said that um, God said, let us make man, mankind or humankind in our own image. So the sense that there was an us in the beginning, right? And that, um, that also talks about that the spirit of God hovers over the waters when God creates. So we get the sense that there is this triune Godhead. That's a big phrase, but it just means that there's three in one. So the sense of this God is three in one. Um, and in John 1, 1, we talked about how uh, in the Gospels that um, we read that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we get the sense that Jesus also was there as part of that triune God, as part of that us in the beginning. Uh, we also understand that God created humankind for a purpose. What was that purpose, Melissa? Relationship. relationship, exactly. So the purpose is relationship. God created us for a purpose. Um, and we also figured out that um, Satan does not want us to have a good relationship with God. That's the whole point of what he tempts Eve for. Um, when he, his goal is to destroy the relationship of Adam and Eve with God. So they weren't allowed to eat one tree. What was the one tree? The knowledge of what? Good and evil. Isn't that interesting? They didn't have a knowledge of what was good and what was evil before then. We all see that there is good and there is evil around us, right? We get that. So, and it, that put a wedge between humankind and God. Um, and in the repercussions, what um, my children's Bible calls a secret rescue plan begins to unfold. So that when God speaks to Adam and Eve and the serpent and says the repercussions for this act you've done, a secret rescue plan begins. And the key phrase is that there's a prophecy over the serpent where it says enmity will follow between the offspring of Eve and the serpent. The serpent will strike the heel but the, uh, but the offspring will crush his head. So that is, in the beginning, we get this sense that there is this plan that's going to unfold. Um, and we talked about what does it mean that the serpent will strike the heel of Eve's offspring. Um, you all can shout it out. What does it mean that he's going to strike the heel of Eve's offspring? What is that referring to? Crucifixion. The crucifixion. That's right. So this point that an offspring of Eve will be struck in a deep way. Um, but then the offspring of Eve will crush the head of the serpent. And what is that? What is Satan's ultimate crushing? You can... Resurrection. Resurrection, exactly. And we've talked about that there is a partial crushing already, already that Jesus has rose from the dead. And we live in this world with the power of the Holy Spirit. We can rise above sin and we see great goodness here on earth. But we also understand that we look forward to that future crushing when there is no more evil, right? When there is no more sin. And unfortunately, this week we experienced a moment of great evil. So um, last week we talked about the patriarchs. We talked about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and how God reached out and established a covenant with the people group. Starting with Abraham, the, that same covenant was reestablished with Isaac and Isaac's son, Jacob. We read that there were three parts of this covenant. God promises three things to Abraham. Do you ladies remember, what were those three things that, you can just shout it out if you remember, what were the three things that were promised to Abraham? Offspring, offspring. yes, I heard offspring over here. So offspring as countless as the stars in the sky. Oh, say that again. People of many nations. People of nations will be what? Do you remember what it is? 
they'll be blessed. The people, uh, the, all the nations on the earth will be blessed through Abraham's offspring, which is a huge promise, right? I mean, a huge promise to give to one person. Um, so it was, we talk about progeny. It was people. It was also, there was a third thing. So it was progeny. It was this great promise of all the nations being blessed. And there was a third thing. What was the third thing that was promised to Abraham? Do you ladies remember? Oh, son. Well, that's progeny. Oh. So um, what was that? Land, yes, Anina. Uh, place. So that's what Paul says. Paul says progeny, place, and then this promise. So that there is this place that the land of Canaan was promised as this everlasting promise to the children of Abraham, to his offspring. And there was one thing, I don't know if you remember, that Abraham was supposed to do to keep this covenant at this point. What was the one thing? That they're supposed to, circumcision, right? So they're all all the males are supposed to be circumcised. And does anybody have any thoughts on why why circumcision? What did that mean? Why was that? What or was that sign of? Any thoughts on that? Separate. Separate, exactly. So it's just a sign that this group of people were different and that they were following a certain God. And that was just a physical mark, a physical sign of doing that. It's a sense of being set apart and of being different than those around you. Um, so last week we saw that all the characters of this, uh, in this story are not perfect, but this covenant was passed down from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, and each of them recommitted to follow and worship God only. We also remember Jacob encountering God in that latter dream, and he says um, in Genesis 28, 20 through 22, if God will be with me and watch over me in this journey, I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household. Then the Lord will be my God. And the stone that I've set up as a pillar will be God's house. And all that you give, I will give to you a tenth. So we see that Jacob has recommitted, just like his father, just like his grandfather, to follow God. Last week, we also learned that Jacob flees the wrath of Esau. Do you all remember that? For pretty much stealing his inheritance and the blessing of his brother Esau. He goes to his uncle Laban's family. Um, I brought this board again. You can see sort of the family tree of how they all work. Abraham. So it's, it's the, the offspring of Abraham's brother, Nahor, um, Rebecca, and Laban. Rebecca is the one who marries Isaac. And then Jacob, he's the one who gets to marry both daughters, Leah and Rachel. He ends up marrying both of them. And then what happens, what we call the baby wars, right? Where each of them try to vie for the attention of Jacob and bring in their maidservants to try and all sort of outproduce each other. And we end up with, out of that, how many, how many sons? Twelve. Twelve sons. And these will become the twelve tribes of Israel. Um, last week, we also learned that God changes Jacob's name to Israel, which means one who wrestles with God. And I thought that that was just a very interesting thing, that that's how God would call him like that's an because usually when god names someone it's sort of a almost a name of a blessing so it's interesting to me that i feel like there's a sense that it's okay to wrestle with god it's okay the thing is that they had that relationship they were, they were present um well, that brings us to this week this week we're going to focus on the story of joseph i actually love the story of joseph um so joseph was um whose son was he do you remember which of the which of the sisters does anybody remember whose son Joseph is? Rachel, right. And so Rachel um, was, did not have children at first. Because Leah was unloved, we, uh, God decided to open her womb. And so she's the one who starts having children at first. So the first four sons, the first four of the 12, are all Leah's children. And then um, eventually it says that God remembers Rachel, and he opens up her womb, and she has Joseph. And then she will eventually have one more son, Benjamin. So Joseph and Benjamin are the two youngest of the 12, and Rachel will die in uh, Benjamin's birth. So that's, we lose her there. Um, so this week, we pick up the story in Genesis 37. Up until this point, Genesis is focused on the story of creation, the covenantal relationship with the patriarchs. But the rest of Genesis focuses too on Joseph. So now we're going to follow the story of Joseph. Now, one thing I know that... I've been talking to you ladies about is that when we study the Bible, I think it's so important to understand context. I had a professor in seminary who would say, context is king. We do not understand it unless we understand our context. So just for the sake of review, um, what book are we still reading? Anyone remember? 
Genesis. Genesis, where does this fall in all the books of the Bible? This is what we call biblical context. Where is it? First book. So we're still in the first book of the Bible. So that's what we call biblical context. Where does it fall in the whole Bible? Um, who's the author? Who wrote Genesis? Moses. Good job. Moses wrote Genesis. He wrote what we call the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Um, audience. Who was this book written to originally? Israelites. Good job. And where were the Israelites most likely when this book was being written? Probably in the desert journey. It's probably after they had left Egypt. And the reason we know this is because we know that Moses dies before the Israelites enter the land of Canaan. And so all of, this, all of these five books had to have been finished before they entered the land of Canaan, since we know that Moses was the author. So somewhere in this desert journey of 40 years, these five books are written. So um, approximately when was it written? Does anybody remember any dates? Yeah, good. I heard some 1450s. That's great. Um, We know in 1406 BC is when Moses dies. So again, it all had to be written before then at some point. Um, And then when do these events occur? Any ideas? When? So they're written somewhere in about 1450. But when are the events that we're reading about in Genesis occurring? Any thoughts on that? Any remember? 3,000 was approximately somewhere about the time of Adam and Eve. So yeah, that's where we started at the beginning of Genesis. At this point, we have progressed a little further. Um, Isaac was born and probably we actually, these great historians who do lots of research have dated it somewhere about 2065 is when Isaac was born. Um, About 1920 is when he marries Rachel and Leah. And we, BC, yep. And then we know Here's a new date for you. It's somewhere about 1876 B.C. that all of the Israelites are settled in Egypt, which is where we're going to end at the end of today. So somewhere in this period is when the events are actually occurring. So we're getting closer now to catching up with our author, right? Because our author is writing in the 1400s. He started historically writing about events that occurred in about 3000 B.C. Now we're moving up to about 1800 B.C. So we're getting closer to when the events occurred. Um, And then anyone remember um, original intent? Why was Genesis written? Any thoughts on that? To give them, to give Israelites hope. Give Israelites hope? Great. Yeah, to give them a sense of their story. Good. Any other thoughts? Why? Yeah, Melissa. To convey there's one God. Good. Exactly. To convey there's one God. One creator God. We think contextually, where were the Israelites, right? They had been living in Egypt. They're about to go on this desert journey. They have been living in this completely pagan culture. And so Moses is reminding them who they are, who they were created by, what is their story, and reminding them that they were created for a relationship. Um, And then I'll ask uh, two more. Genre. Any ideas what kind of writing? There's, what we see is there's different styles of writing in the Bible. Um, there is historical. There's prophecy. There's poetry. Um, any thoughts? What kind of writing is Genesis? Genesis 1 is poetry. And that's where we talked about the creation account being poetic and why that makes it a little bit different. But after we move past Genesis 1, what type of writing are we in? Any thoughts? Historical. So it's considered a historical account. Now, as with all sort of histories, this Moses is not trying to write a complete history. He's trying to write what's most important for the Israelites to know and to remember. Because this, again, is directed as an Israelite audience. Um, last question, historical context. Does anyone know anything about what was going on in the ancient Near East that they can throw out somewhere in about the 2000s to 1500s BC? Who is, I'll ask you this, who was the great superpower? You guys can probably guess. Egypt. Egypt Egypt was the great superpower at that time. So historically, we look, Egypt was the one who had, like, you know, the great um, government, I guess, at that point. Um, We know that the pyramids, the first pyramid was built in 2630 B.C., So when the Israelites were there, the pyramids were there. So we can kind of begin to think where, when, how, what it felt like, who they were. Um, 
So that's great. Good job, ladies. So, okay, so now that we've kind of framed our text, um, we're going to start reading Genesis and the story of Joseph. The big question that I'm going to answer, that we are going to answer today, is how the heck do the Israelite people all get to Egypt? Because those of us who know a little bit about the Bible know that when they do their desert wandering, where do they leave from? Egypt. And they're going back to the land of Canaan. Well, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob already lived in Canaan. So our question is, how did they get to Egypt and why? So that's also what we're going to be looking at today. Um, Okay, so what we're going to see is we're going to see that God is going to create a plan to sustain his people, a plan that will involve Jacob's youngest son, Joseph. Um, So let's start reading, finally. Okay, I'm going to start reading Genesis 37, um, verse 1. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Um, Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, which probably means that Leah and Rachel have both passed at this point. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel, love, so Israel and Jacob is, are going to be used interchangeably, okay? Same guy. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So I'm going to, as we go through and study today, I'm going to be asking you ladies questions. And the questions are directly in the text. So you don't have to have any prior biblical knowledge to try and and answer a question, okay? So um, where is Joseph living at this point? Canaan. Canaan. Good. Um, How old is he? 17. Awesome. Um, How do we know, uh, or what do we know about Jacob's relationship with Joseph? Favorite son. Yes. Uh, besties, I like that. Um, why was he Jacob's favorite son? Because child of Rachel. Child of Rachel, and Rachel was his favorite wife, and of of them all. Um, what does Israel do to cause Joseph's brothers to hate him even more? Makes him a coat, uh, some multicolored coat. There's a great play made after that. <laughs> yeah. Um, Yes, technical or dream goat. What happens to Joseph to make his brothers hate him even more? The dreams. So he has these dreams that all these, the, the, these sheaves of wheat are bowing down to him, and then the sun and the moon and the stars all bowing down to him. So imagine, like, a 17-year-old boy, right? And he's giving, saying all this to you. It, it might be kind of hard to not hate him, you know? Like, um, and we, we learn later on in our next text that he was very handsome. If I know some very tall, handsome 17-year-old boys, and I can just, you can imagine, you know, probably the kind of kid that he was. Um, so, um, and I'm sure that he probably loved telling them all that they were going to be bowing down to him someday. Um, okay, so what happens next? I'm going to continue reading um, Genesis 37, 12. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to them, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance. And before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. 
Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, do you remember who Reuben is? Where does he fall in line? Oldest brother. brother. So he's going to have a sense of wanting to protect probably his younger brothers. Probably the wrath of his father would fall on Reuben if anything were to happen to Joseph. Um, When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So we see that Reuben's heart is good here. Um, So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Um, Ishmaelites. Do you guys remember who the Ishmaelites are? Who was Ishmael? Uh huh. So Hagar's son through Abraham. So remember how God said that part of that He was actually going to bless the Ishmaelites and that they're going to become a great nation. So we see that they already have that. There's this group of Ishmaelites who come along. Um, so let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for twenty shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, The boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took their ornate robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. Obviously. Uh, He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes. That would be a sign of mourning in Jewish culture. Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. All right, so a couple more questions. So the brothers are in Shechem. They're grazing sheep. They see Joseph come along, and they think this is their opportunity to get rid of him. Um, Remember that the Bible is a story of people behaving very badly sometimes. (laughs) This is not a story of everyone doing the right thing. Um, But God still intervenes, still loves, and uses circumstances to bring about his will. So a couple brothers oppose the plan. First, it was Reuben, right? Reuben, the oldest son, he opposes the plan. Um, and um, he is the firstborn. We also see that Judah, Judah also is going to oppose the plan. And what's interesting is that uh, we are going to see that Judah's line, at the end of today, we're going to see that Judah's line is the line that's going to be blessed. And so even though Judah is an imperfect person, we actually see him in Scripture trying to do the right thing, which is um, why, essentially, his line is going to be blessed. Um, he sold to the Ishmaelites, Ishmaelites, son of Hagar. Uh, where does Joseph end up? Where is he going to end up after he's sold? Egypt. Egypt. He arrives in Egypt, the great superpower of the time. Um, and then in whose house does Joseph end up? Uh, Potiphar's house. Potiphar is who? The cap- captain of the guard of Pharaoh. So probably a very, very important official in this group. So he was probably, I mean, captain of the guard. I would think he was one of Pharaoh's right-hand men. So that's where Joseph ends up. Um, So he is not an ideal situation. He is a slave. But we're going to see that what's really neat about Joseph and that we see all through this is that Joseph is faithful and he works hard. We never see him have this, like, bitter or complaining spirit. We see him actually trying to make the best out of whatever circumstances that he's in. And I think there's something in that that we can all like, appreciate and learn from. So, um, all right. So Genesis 39 is where I'm skipping to, 2 through 6. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. 
Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted it to his care, entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in, in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. All right. So the story is going to get a little bit seedy from here. I'm going to kind of glo- I'm going to give you some Cliff Notes version. So we know that uh, Joseph is handsome, very handsome, and apparently Potiphar's wife decides that she would like to get to know Joseph very well. Uh, so she continues to try and petition him to sleep with her, and he continues saying no. So this is it's fabulous. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it's a great story. And then what happens is at one point, she actually catches him in her house, and she says, sleep with me now, to the point that he actually flees without his clothes. Like, she's, like, holding on to his jacket, and he, like... Just, I'm sure, sort of lets it fall off of him and runs. He just runs out of there. And um, at that point, then Potiphar's wife then accuses him of rape, and he is put in jail. But we get the sense that maybe Potiphar doesn't entirely believe her because even though it says he's mad, he isn't killed. And I think that in this kind of situation, if Potiphar really believed his wife, there's a good chance that he would have been killed. But he gets in put in jail. Um, and I really love what Joseph says. I'm just reading 39, nine. That's what, when, uh, Potiphar's wife is sort of petitioning him, he says to her, no one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? So you see in his heart that he realizes that it would be sinning against God for him to, you know, to give into this. And I think it's really neat because we just sort of begin to get this capture of who Joseph was, who, what his priorities were, what was important to him. And you really see that he very much, uh, he devoutly followed God, um, which I love. Okay. So, um, and you know, so things have kind of gone from bad to worse. At first he was just a slave, but he was a slave in a pretty nice household. And he sounds like he was being treated really well. Um, well, now he's in jail. And, but what's interesting is we don't see him bitter. We don't see him angry. Instead, we see the exact same thing that happened to him in Potiphar's house happen to him again in jail. So I'm going to read from Genesis 29 or 39, 20b, a few verses. So, but while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him and he showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. So I just think it's so neat to see how Joseph behaves in this situation, how he continues to work his best, continues to be his best, um, and he's not bitter at everything going on around him. Um, So then we get the story of the cupbearer and the baker. I'm going to give you the cliff notes of this too. So two men arrive in prison with Joseph, one cupbearer, one baker. You guys probably all get what a baker is. Bakes. He bakes. Uh, (laughs) Cupbearer. Anybody know what a cupbearer was in the ancient Near East? uh, Right. So because in that day, you know, A pharaoh would probably, was maybe afraid of everyone around him, was afraid of constantly being overthrown. And so a cupbearer was a person who would have literally tasted his cup of wine or his cup of water before the pharaoh drank from it. So I know it's kind of a scary role, right? You know, like, what if it was poisoned? So I'm not really sure I would want that role, but it was, I guess it was considered a great role. So um, both of these two men end up in jail, and both the cupbearer and the baker have dreams. And they come to, for some reason, they're talking about them. They come to Joseph, and Joseph is able to give them interpretations for their dreams, what they mean. And he interprets them accurately. He says that the baker is actually going to be killed in three days, and he says the cupbearer is actually going to be um, reinstated back into his position in three days. And Joseph says to him, um, he says, remember me when you get reinstated. So Genesis forty fourteen, 
Um, Joseph says to the baker, it says, but what, or to the cupbearer, but when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness, mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And even here, I've done nothing to deserve being put in this dungeon. And, um, does the cupbearer remember him? Not right away. Instead, we read, um, in 40, 20 through 23, says, Now uh, the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for his officials. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that he once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he impaled the chief baker, just as Joseph had said to them in his interpretation. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. So a full two years is going to pass. Two years. God has a plan in the midst of it. And um, we're going to begin to see that plan unfold. So I'm going to move on to um, Genesis 41. I'm going to read 1 through 4. When two full years had passed, remember him saying, remember me when you get out of here. Two years later. Full two years have passed. Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing by the Nile when out of the river there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed among the reeds. After that, seven other cows, ugly and gaunt, came up out of the Nile and stood beside those on the riverbank. And the cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up the sleek, seven sleek, fat cows. And then Pharaoh woke up. All right. So Pharaoh has this dream of, and there's a second part to it too. So it's first, it's, Um, seven ugly cows eat seven healthy cows. And then there's a second part of the dream where it's seven thin heads of grain eat up seven fat heads of grain. So these are his dreams. So um, Pharaoh kind of freaks out at this point. He's had these two dreams. They're very, very clear. And so he begins getting all his magicians and wise men to come and try and tell him what they mean. What do these dreams mean? And no one knows. And no one can interpret his dream. And so now at this point, our cupbearer, two years later, remembers Joseph. And he says, Pharaoh, there's this dude in prison. He can interpret dreams. So Joseph is sent for, and let's listen to their dialogue. So Genesis 41, 15, and 16. I'm skipping over to. Okay. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And this is great what Joseph says. He says, I cannot do it. Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. So do you see how he gives full authority to God? God is the one who's going to do this, not me. I can stand here and I can tell you, but it's God. It's God who gives interpretations. Um, I love that. So he gives credit to God, not to himself. All right. Um. So he is able to interpret the dream correctly, and I'm going to go down to Genesis 41, picking it up in verse 28. It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten, and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream is given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God, and God will do it soon. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh. It should be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt. So the country may not be ruined by the famine. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man? One in whom is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace. And all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. I feel like we need a little pause right here. I just think that's amazing. Remember where we've come from, right? Joseph came. He was started as a slave. And then he went. He was in prison for a number of years. Um, so, we th- so there's a lot of bad things <laughs> that have happened to Joseph. But um, 
what do you ladies notice about his attitude in all of this? He doesn't complain. Isn't that amazing? I think it's really amazing to see his attitude, his heart coming out in all of this. He doesn't complain. He just submits to God. It's, it's amazing to me. Um, so now Joseph is in charge. He gets married. He has two sons. And what's really cool is he gives them Hebrew names. And again, that even shows where his heart is, where his allegiance lies. He still follows God, even though he's living in Egypt, living in this um, you know, Egyptian culture. So his first son, he names Manasseh. And Manasseh means forget. And what he's saying is that God has made me forget all the troubles of my father's household. That's from, um, that's from scripture. And then his second son is Ephraim. Ephraim, Ephraim means twice full. And it, Joseph says, God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. So I love the names that he gives them. Um, and so everything happens exactly as Joseph has said. There are seven great years of abundance that follow. And they store up their grain and they have all their reserves. And then famine follows, just as is predicted. And famine spreads to Canaan and to Jacob's family. So I'm going to pick up our story, Genesis 42, 1. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I have heard there's grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Then ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others, because he was afraid that harm might come to him. Apparently, he doesn't trust the older ten. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain, for there was a famine in the land of Canaan also. Now, Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. Isn't that great? I love that. Remember his dreams? As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from, he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to see see where our land is unprotected. No, my lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. The servants are, we servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said to them, you have come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, your servants were 12 brothers, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father and one is no more. Joseph said to them, it is just as I told you, you are spies. This is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place until your youngest brother comes here. And I'm going to skip down to verse 19. If you are honest men, that one of your brothers stay here in prison while the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me so that your words may be verified and that you may not die. This they proceeded to do. They said to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come on us. Reuben replied, Didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. They did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. Isn't that cool? I just feel like I want to be a fly on the wall. Um, He turned away from them and began to weep, but but then came back and spoke to them again. He had Simeon taken from them and bound before their eyes. Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain to put each man's silver back in his sack and to give them provisions for their journey. After this was done for them, they loaded their grain on their donkeys and left. So imagine being Joseph, right? Imagine having all this power and authority in your hands, your brothers actually bowing down to you, as was predicted. uh, Remember his dreams. Um, Here's a question. What motivation do you think he had for wanting Benjamin I think so. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, he wanted to see him. I think you're right. It's like his only, like, full brother, and probably he, and most likely, Joseph, if he was 17, you know, Benjamin was probably quite young when he left, when he was sold. Yeah. <laughs> I think he wanted to make sure he was safe. I think you're right, Anita. I wanted to make sure he was safe. Yeah, totally. I think you're right. Yeah, he's probably wanted to protect him too. 
Um, so, yes. Now, um, oh, and then it's interesting who gets locked up. It's the second brother. He doesn't actually lock up Reuben. I think that's really interesting because you remember Reuben was the one who defended him. So he goes down to the second brother, Simeon, and locks him up as dead. <laughs> I love that. Um, so now the brothers know. So they leave. They return to Canaan. But they know they cannot return to Egypt unless they bring who with them? Benjamin. Benjamin. They cannot come back without Benjamin. So, um, but the famine continues, but Jacob won't let them return because he's too worried about anything happening to Benjamin. So finally, Judah pledges to Jacob, says, on my life, I will protect this boy, but we have to go back or all of our households are going to starve. So um, they do. So all of them return to to Egypt. They um, present themselves to Joseph in Egypt. And um, this is kind of interesting. So then... Joseph doesn't reveal himself to them right away. He puts grain in their bags and sends them on their way. But he puts a silver cup in Benjamin's sack. Do you all remember this? And then he sends his guards after them and says that whoever's pack, whoever's bag the silver cup is found in must return and be his slave. And I kind of feel like there's a little bit like this might have been Joseph's original plan, you know? Like, he wasn't necessarily at first thinking about the salvation of all of his people. He was kind of like, I'm just going to get my brother back. And you all, you all go back to Canaan, you know? (laughs) So I love that. Um, But then what's so great is all the brothers then return, and Judah, Judah comes and pleads for Benjamin's life. And I love that. Um, Okay, so they all return to... um, to Joseph, and they present themselves again before him, and Joseph is at this point going to reveal who he is. So I'm picking up our story in Genesis 44, verse uh, 33. I'm skipping over to. Okay. Now, um, Joseph, okay, sorry. Now then, please let your servant remain here as my Lord's slaves. This is Judah speaking. So he's saying, don't take Benjamin. Now then, please let your servant here remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy, And let the boy return with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? No, do not let me see the misery that would come to my father. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his his attendants. And he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him. And Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. They were like, oh, you're alive. (laughs) Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. That's just amazing. For two years now, there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there'll be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. That's so interesting when we begin to think even about our own lives, that God sometimes works in ways we don't understand to bring about some kind of greater good, some kind of greater plan. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler over all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has given, has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children and your grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all you have, I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. All right, so imagine being the brothers. <laughs> How would you feel? <laughs> scared, right? <laughs> Pretty scared at this point. Um, so, um, and I just love, I love to look at the words of Joseph. What, what do we learn about Joseph's understanding of God when we look at his words? Any thoughts on that? What was that? He get yeah, glorifies him. But he trusts him. Trusts him, totally. Total trust. That's a really good observation, Amina. Um, 
Anyone else? What do we see? What do we learn about Joseph's understanding of God? God's plan is for good. That's awesome. Anyone else? Good. I think that's all good. That's all true. Um, And what do we learn about the way that God sometimes works? Mysterious ways. We don't always get it, do we? Yeah. But he redeems all things. Exactly. That's so well said. That's awesome. So good. So Joseph sends Egyptians and carts back to Canaan and brings and moves everyone to Egypt. So moves. Yeah. How long is this journey? They are going back and forth and back and yeah. forth. How long does it take them? How far is good it? question. Good question. I mean, I can't answer that right now. I had some maps last week. I should have brought them again this week. Yeah, it's definitely a journey. It is, yeah. It's not like, hey, just uh, one day. You know, I imagine it was weeks to months. It would have been a journey. Um, I like the, it says that Joseph sends back carts to Canaan to carry the children and their stuff. Because um, you can imagine that, so scripture actually says that at this point, 70 people move to Egypt. So it's the brothers, it's their wives, it's the children that they have all had at this point, all move. And um, that's a big group that ends up. Um, so, and they settle in Goshen, which is this area outside of the main city. Um, and I think that Joseph does that purposely because I think there's a sense of them being able to be separate, to not be right in the heart of Egyptian culture, to try and maintain their own Hebrew identity and beliefs, their own religion. Um, so then um, some years pass, but Jacob, Jacob is ill. And he's on his deathbed. Um, And this is kind of the last part of the story I want to focus on. But it's interesting. So when, now remember that previously we've had Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they have all blessed one of their sons pretty much on their deathbed, right? So now we're going to get to this scene where Jacob, he is on his, Jacob slash Israel is on his deathbed. He's going to call all 12 of these boys in and bless them. Um, so, um, at first though, he first, he calls in Ephraim and Manasseh and he actually blesses them and counts them as his own sons. So essentially, so when you guys hear of the 12 tribes of Israel, do you ever hear of the tribe of Joseph? No, it's not there. We hear of the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh are both called the half tribes. And the reason is that Jacob wants to essentially give a double inheritance to Joseph's family. Um, But now, wait, that gives us 13 tribes, right? So does anybody know why we all, we, there are 12 tribes that settle in 12 portions of land eventually when we get back to Canaan? Yes, good job. One of them is the priestly clan. So the Levites are going to become the priestly clan priestly clan and not give any, not receive any land of their own, but essentially be in all of the 12 portions of land. So um, when you read of the 12 tribes of Israel, it's the Levites removed essentially because they're the priestly clan, Ephraim and Manasseh added in, but we still have 12. We stick with 12. Um, But that's a little bit ahead of us. Um, Okay. So Jacob calls for his sons to say goodbye, to offer a blessing. Um, And we've seen again that this blessing has been passed. And we've seen that not everyone we expect to get this blessing. Um, Isaac is is signaled out over uh, Ishmael, right? Um, God says his blessing, his inheritance will pass through Isaac. Jacob over Esau. Um, So now it's interesting. Jacob actually passes over his first three sons. So he passes over Reuben, um, Simeon, and Gad, I think. I forget the name of number three. Um, but all three of them, and we've kind of, I've skipped these portions in the story, but all three of them do sort of really significant acts that are bad, that are not great. And so we see that Isaac has, re- or Jacob, sorry, has recognized this. And because of those um, really poor actions invite, involving rape and death, and we won't get into it. So Jacob passes over him, and he goes over them, and he goes to his fourth son. Who's the fourth son? Judah. So Judah should begin to kind of strike a chord for us, for those of us who are a little bit familiar with the Bible, um, because we Judah should sound a little bit um, familiar. 
Because do you remember when we talk about the lineage of Jesus, what clan does he descend from? The line of Judah. Judah. So this is something that is going to be now begin to be called out. So, and it's really interesting. I'm just going to read the blessing given to Judah. So um, I'm picking up in Genesis 20, sorry, Genesis 49, 10. Okay. Uh, And it's a little bit longer, but I'm going to focus on one verse. So this is the verse that's really interesting. So um, this is what Jacob says to Judah. He says, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. So this is this sort of future prophecy being told over Judah, over the line of Judah that's going to follow. So any ideas of what does it mean that the scepter, what is a scepter? Anybody know? Yeah, something a king carries. Yeah, okay. The scepter will not depart from Judah. So what is that saying? Any ideas? There will be, yes, there will always be a ruler from Judah on the throne. So that, so the scepter will not depart from Judah. But this doesn't really entirely make sense because at this point, is there a king? No. Eventually, we will get to a period of the monarchy in Israel, but this time there is no king. So there is no king for a scepter to depart from. And it's that, and that even when that monarchy does come, it's actually going to be pretty short-lived. They don't do a really good job of monarchy. We're going to get there. Um, so, and it says, also, until the scepter will not depart from Judah, until to whom it belongs shall come. So we think, yeah, I just heard Jesus. So we think, in a sense... Jesus as the ultimate king descending from this line of Judah. So the scepter will not depart until he to whom it belongs shall come. Um, So even though at this point they would not, we have hindsight, we say, yes, that was referring to Jesus. They, of course, didn't have that at this point. But what they do see, do have, is this beginning sense that this great ruler is going to come from the tribe of Judah. So what um, as what we're trying to do is beginning to get into Hebrew thought, understanding where did this thought come from? Because when Jesus comes, there was an expectation of a Messiah to come. So where did that thought come from? And we see it right here. So the scepter will not depart um, from Judah. So there's this beginning sense of a great ruler to come. And then we do know that Jesus does descend from the line of Judah. So when you guys are reading like Matthew, I think, is one of the first books that has this huge, like, lineage of Jesus, right? And it's so easy just to, like, skip over all these names. Why are all of these names here? Why are we reading about where Jesus came from? But do you see why? Because the, the New Testament authors wanted to trace Jesus back through the line of Judah. They wanted to show this guy comes from the line of Judah. This guy is the one that they were talking about. This is the one whose scepter will never depart. So that's why it's so important for us to understand the Old Testament so that we really get it when we get to the New Testament and we get, we get who Jesus was and who he was trying to reveal himself to be. Um, so, um, okay, so Jacob dies. Uh, I love it. His brothers are still really afraid of him. So uh, Genesis fifty seventeen b is where I'm going to end today in our scripture. Uh, okay, so the brothers um, now send a message to him, and they say, um, Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father, whom their message came... Uh, when the, sorry. So, now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept, His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. So you intended this for harm. God intended it for good. I think that is like the major teaching point, the major phrase we get from the story of Joseph. Um, all right. So what did, what have we learned today? We've learned that, um, 
God uses Joseph to preserve the Israelite people during the famine. He, we learn that um, we understand how and why the Israelite people get to Egypt, right? We're going to pick up next week. Next week, we're going to be talking about them leaving Egypt. Um, but now we know how they got there. And we see a promise of a, uh, this promise of a great ruler to come beginning to take root in the Israelite mindset. So that's also what we've seen. Um, I Personally, I would say I kind of am in awe of Joseph and his perspective on life. I think that we don't always understand pain when we're in the midst of it. Um, and I know all of us have gone through times of great pain. I think sometimes, especially when we believe that we are following God and doing the right thing, and still sometimes things happen that are really hard. And um, sometimes we get sort of glimpses of God's purpose and God's goodness, but sometimes we don't. Sometimes we don't always understand what is going on, what what sort of the big plan is. And um, I think back, so in my... When I was in my early 20s, I got into um, a relationship that was really bad. It was really toxic. But I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that I had been called into that. And it was one of, I came out of it really sort of confused and asking God why. I was following you. I know I was following you. So why? Why did it go so badly? And for years, I really struggled with that and really struggled with the pain of that. I... Even though I had been to seminary, I got out of, I got out of working at um, any kind of a church involvement for a long time because I felt like I couldn't lead if I wasn't in a place where I even understood what God was doing in my own life. And so, you know, years pass and way leads to way, and now it's um, almost 15 years later. And now I have this perspective where I'm so thankful to be exactly where I am right now. Like, I'm so thankful for my husband for my two amazing children. Um, I'm so thankful even for this moment to finally be working at a church again and feel like this is the moment that God was preparing me for. This is where he was bringing me. And I know that if I hadn't walked through those early years, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be who I am now. I wouldn't um, probably have gained a lot of humility that I needed to gain. I wouldn't have understood God's grace in a way that I do now. So I think that sometimes we don't get it, you know, when we're in it. But I will absolutely say that I now am thankful that that happened to me um, because of where it led me, because of where I am right now. And I think so often that when we have some kind, some years and some perspective, we're able to be thankful for some of the biggest tragedies in our lives. Um, one of my close girlfriends, she tried for, uh, for seven years to get pregnant or to adopt. And for seven years, the answer was no, 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 no. And those of us who are moms, we, you guys know how hard it is if that's your story. If you've struggled so much to get pregnant. And um, finally at the end, and I remember saying to her in this time, we don't know how the story is going to end All we know right now is that the answer is no, but we don't know how the story is going to end. And eventually, for them, they ended up opening themselves up to um, take sort of an imperfect child and were matched with a little boy who just needed a few surgeries, and he is perfect now, and nothing neurological. And when she came home, she was pregnant, and she was 42. And I think of her story and how... You know, some, I tease her now. I'm like, some days you want to throw them out the window, don't you? You know, now you have two boys are 18 months apart. Yay. And you're... <laughs> but I think of her story and how we both knew. I mean, she's a really faithful woman. We knew in the midst of it that God was doing something. And we didn't know what God was doing. And now, now we see that there was this plan. There was a plan for these two boys to be in my friend's house. And... Um, So those are sort of the thoughts I had as I was thinking through the story of Joseph. And so, um, oh, goodness, we are almost out of time, aren't we? Um, But I would love for you ladies to spend a few minutes at your tables um, just talking with each other. Um, The questions, I did put some questions on your table. Um, 
So the questions I had for you to talk about is, um, if you want to, the first one, though I actually maybe we'll skip that one. The first one was, what struck you about Joseph's story? Um, what did you learn or relate to? But I think one thing I would love for you all to share, if you're comfortable, is number two. Can you share a story or a moment you saw God bring great goodness out of a really hard situation in your life? So that's the one that I'll leave you on. And if you want to spread a part, if maybe you can. <laughs> um, but thank you, ladies. I'll clo- let's let you talk for, we have about seven or eight minutes, and then I will give us an official close.